Hello, everybody. Today's event activity is a sharing of practice and revealment around is jewellery a luxury? Something becomes a luxury because of the way it is experienced. So each of the participants sitting around this table today was set a task. They were asked to select a material object and transform through enchantment or an everyday alchemical process to turn the piece into luxury that can be worn. So I'm going to invite my fellow participants to start that revealment. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wanted to start the conversation um, by introducing myself to my fellow person sitting next to me. Hello, Kate. Hi, Ricardo. Oh, you already know my name. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, I first wanted to start uh, by talking about the item that I had brought in and some also to start with reading a quote. Um, the quote is, luxury is no longer just an object standing or a rich material. It is also what values the body and creates pleasure, a beautiful journey, a great restaurant, an exceptional moment, a work of art. My perspective on this is looking at the way that uh, materials have different experiences of luxury and luxury from the perspective of the transformations that occur in materials. I also like to think of the way that something might become a luxury uh, through the way that we engage with it and the things that we do with it through time, through wear, and a lot of processes. So, Kate, mm -hmm. are you ready? Yes. To be transformed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start with, I brought in two objects. So I've brought in an object that is my image, which is, oh, here we go, yep, here. Um, this is actually an I IKEA kitchen curtain that has been transformed through some, some uh, processes and materiality that changes the way that it functions and operates. Um, I think that luxury is about the way that it changes your dynamic with something, and it's something for it's something for me, and it's something else for other people um, in how you engage with it. Um, but I have brought in two objects, and the second object or thing that I've brought in is a very, very old and worn T-shirt because I think that wearing something is a luxury, and wear and use is also something that gives us a relationship with objects and material things. So, Kate, I think I'm going to go for the T-shirt first. Okay. So, I see... Oh, no, I'm in the way. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very, 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 very worn T-shirt from a very dear friend of mine. Um, the T-shirt has been bleached and bleached and bleached, and it has its own kind of uh, lack of functionality, and I guess that is also about the question of when does something become jewellery as opposed to a material? Okay. Thoughts, Kate? Um, <laughs> <laughs> how are we going to do this? <laughs> sure. Do you want me to have stand? A no, let's sit okay. for the moment. Um, uh, I'll see if I can prop this in. Right. Maybe I'll just slip it in with yep. this. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, did that work? No. Sort of. You can use my necklace if you want. Oh, that's a good idea. That works quite well. Hmm. All right. <laughs> Part one. So, Ricardo. It's my friend Gian's shirt. Oh, All right, yeah. Yes. Dear friend who washes and washes and washes and washes these shirts and bleaches them. Mm. But the wear is really interesting around the neck. Yeah, I love that. 
and the way it kind of, yeah, it, it takes on its own quality. Mm. And maybe I'll move to, do I have time for object very quickly, two? Very quickly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Object two I will bring out because I think it's, it's luxurious and a kind of across a hybrid state between materials and hard items because of its weight. Okay. So I might just actually, maybe I'll drape you elegantly. Oh. <laughs> Use the handles on maybe the chair. Maybe I'll just do a bit of this <laughs> one. I may need my hand, so I might do this. A bit of a shawl. Mm. Chantelle, we might need a luxury spotlight. <laughs> I think we might need to <laughs> give it a bit of a <laughs> bit of a patina. <laughs> Bring out the the luxury light. <laughs> Beautiful. <It's> gorgeous. <laughs> the luster really becomes exactly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that there. Okay. Hi Spencer. Maybe <laughs> I'll bye -bye. start introducing myself. <laughs> <sighs> so I'm not just a model, I'm an artist too. Oh. Um, <laughs> I brought in um, an image, which is a, um, a selfie I took in at the um, a Salvation Army op shop. Um, it's sort of an outtake from a photo shoot I did with Blake Barnes a couple of years ago. Um, but I'm trying on a, a glass vase as a, a potential shoe. Um, and I thought it was a good introduction because I work with photography and sculpture, often found objects and kind of shows a um, very kind of mundane, playful, transformative moment. Mm. So I thought that would set a nice tone. Um, and my object that I brought in um, is some portable fairy lights. Um, one of the words that um, I was thinking about in the brief for this object was the idea of enchantment and um, alchemy. And I thought of... Um, fairy lights as a, I kind of find them quite disgusting in most contexts, but um, there is something quite alluring about them and I thought it would be, ooh, ooh. Um, <laughs> an interesting <laughs> object to style. <laughs> How do you want to put it on? All right, sorry, I have to work with this. Um, <laughs> help. Um, all right, Spencer, I'm gonna untangle this. Mm -hmm. Where did you obtain these fairy lights from? Um, I bought them on eBay oh, yeah. a while ago. Yeah. <coughs> I saw someone selling like boxes and boxes of these for like two hundred dollars for like Really? I think it was a set of like two hundred sets. They're often um bought for weddings and placed inside gems. Yeah, it was so good. She like was like, I've had chic. a blast, but I need to sell these now. And it's like <laughs> 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 she obviously just had like a wedding and then wanted to sell them off. I feel like they're popular with um for teenage bedrooms, um yeah. obviously Christmas wedding decorations and then <laughs> yeah. I feel like they're a bedroom <laughs> Accessory of choice for yeah. slightly unhinged people over their 21. <laughs> yeah. so, um, I know. I was feel, thinking about putting them up in a little too, a little bit too much. I think I would like this <laughs> if you kind of had sexy. something yeah. sheer on. I feel like it would look really nice glowing through yeah. fabric, but this is a bit dense. And yeah. I've got a lot of cords happening here, so I might just yeah. kind of add to that. Yeah. And Work I might bring some forward to illuminate this beautiful brooch you're wearing, Spencer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think you need a luxury light on your. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's to highlight it a little bit. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you, Kate. Um, so my name is Spencer. Um, I'm an artist as well, and Kate and I met in oh, sorry, in honors um, at VCA in 2014. Um, so a lot of my work, uh, I also work in sculpture and installation-based sort of practice. Um, it extends to fashion and editing of found materials. So this hat, for example, let's put it under here, um, <laughs> is something that I've been kind of sourcing and found hats or stolen hats or stolen items and then editing them in my own process. So I thought I would wear it today as an object that I've actually kind of been utilizing oh, for the glamour light. Um, so there's some beads on there and some resin sort of like necklace pieces and texture, wax. Um, so I think that, yeah, the, the process of luxury for me, um, yeah, I guess to, trans, to transmogrify an object is kind of, 
can be through so many different processes. What I bought in was this little um, Mark Jacobs Daisy lid that I stole from IKEA, so I steal these all the time. Um, this is <laughs> <laughs> Where are they? From <laughs> IKEA. Yeah, you know how like they have like the fake bedroom sets. Oh uh, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 They had this was like set up there, and I thought it was really funny. Oh, and, like, no one needs bottle. this. Yeah. Yeah. From oh, the yeah. perfume bottle. Daisy, so it's a course. lid from Mark Daisy. Jacobs Daisy. Yeah, yeah I should say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, s I try and steal them all the time when I don't feel too you know shy about it. Um, and I use <laughs> <laughs> and I use the yeah, we all know <laughs> the pedals in different <laughs> in different ways. So I think like the again like the the idea of luxury in perfume, you know, the entry level of um, luxury items in design houses is usually perfume and cologne, and um, is it accessible? But it wears off, and uh, I think the idea of yeah, I. Um, my action was stealing it, so I think that sometimes luxury can be stolen and mm. it should be stolen from time to time and like redistributed in a different way or re sort of um, approach. So I'm going to put this mm. onto. Sorry, I should have been talking to you this I whole was, time. I was <laughs> <talking> <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was looking at nothing in particular because I'm really shy. I was, so. uh, we were talking <laughs> through the screen. <laughs> oh, yeah, through the screen. So I'm going to put this into Chantelle's hair, which she has gracefully agreed for me to do. I brushed it in. A, in a brushing <laughs> way. I'm actually gonna slightly knot it a little, not knot it, but just okay. set it in there so it doesn't fall <laughs> <laughs> And are you happy to wear it at the front or is that annoying? I wherever you think it That's should good. be, Spencer. I think it looks nice. Does it, oh. does it look good? Yeah. Perfect. Should yeah, I? I think we need a bit of a luxury how? light on A bit of a luxury <laughs> light? Yeah. Oh yeah. <gasps> yeah. Oh, I've got to come oh, out wow. of the screen. It's beautiful. Can I leave it in there as long yeah, as I possibly can? Yeah, you may, can? please. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Chantal. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Alex, I'm going to introduce myself to you. And this is kind of a nice flip of the table, I guess, because you've spent a lot of time talking to me about your practice, and now it's my turn to talk to you about mine. <laughs> so um, the image that I brought in today is um, it's essentially a drawing, and the drawing is a meditation on what the idea of luxury is. It's a drawing that consists of writing the word luxury 100 times on a piece wow. of tracing paper. It's not that many times, I'm sure we could... How many? Up it's only 100. Oh, okay. Only yeah. 100. Only 100. <laughs> <laughs> There's that a little section time. down there. Oh, so you... Tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess the idea at the moment for me is that in terms of practice, the idea of luxury is kind of a bit of a point of meditation. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of been working with the idea that maybe my... Um, Practice is also in a state of luxury. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the item that I brought in today yes. as well, because it kind of actually um, speaks to what Spencer was talking about in the idea of theft with luxury. Oh, wow. And so this item is kind of... This. this is my... Um, this is like the Pirates of Chanel. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it's made with a broken pair of sunglasses and a, a square of silk organza and also just a found brass chain. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like the idea of piracy in relation to luxury and particularly in French luxury when we think about someone like Napoleon who was very much a, a thief of craftsmanship of sorts that was reapplied to French luxury. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 I do feel like a bit of a pirate. A bit of a pirate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a wild pirate. A wild pirate. Definitely a bit unhinged. I do have one other that one other item here as well um, that is kind of similar but different. And this one's the Ode to the Silkworm. And this is kind of about, I guess, again, a type of meditation on actually giving thanks to the silkworm for producing the yarn for these cloths. And so rather than doing something to... I've tried to turn the cloth back to the original yarn that the silkworm spent all of that time spinning for us. So that's this wow. one. Yeah. So is this the same material? This is the same material and the same size. So maybe we can put this one... As a hair. Over here. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> How do I look? <laughs> I feel like I'm wearing a wig. <laughs> oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> so quick. 
Okay, so I'll introduce myself to Blake. Hey, Alex. Um, we actually had this conversation yesterday. We did. <laughs> we'll have it again. We'll just rehab. We'll do an abbreviated version. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess with my practice, I'm mostly interested in the relationship between materials and our idea of how they should perform yeah. and then interfering with the expectation we have of those materials and seeing what happens. Yeah. Um, so what's this image that you've got? So of? this image I have for a while been sort of developing, I guess, fake signatures, yeah. which is what this is, um, and then I guess putting them onto things and having that as sort of, I don't know. Like a an, logo? Or yeah, like a logo or like an applied meaning, but then I guess it's... Then I, it's a, this has actually turned into my real signature <laughs> over time, yeah. which it used to not be. <laughs> so it's kind of, I guess the meaning has kind of changed. But um, I'll get out my what I brought. So this is made from a sponge. Okay. Yeah. And it can be worn as a ring or a bag. Yeah. <laughs> so how does it operate as a bag? As a bag. Or the functions kind of no longer. The functions have mostly been removed, so it's mostly ornamental. Yeah. But you could still carry it over your shoulder. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can. Yeah. Yeah. Away like from home. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> but you can wear it as a ring or you could, yeah. you know, fasten it in your hair. It's quite elegant. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. But, um, and you can still use it to clean as well. It's a product. <laughs> <laughs> Mopping up all those wine spills. Yeah, it's actually. Yeah. <laughs> as, nice. um, yeah, it's been through quite a lot. I've taken it to a lake really and it's mopped up with sand. <laughs> so, cool. yeah, it's had a bit of a history. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh sure. So, Blake, we might read another quote as we yeah, move sure. around on the screen. Something becomes a luxury by being experienced by a person in a particular way. So, luxury is always something for someone, and more specifically, for someone who whose possession of that something is bound up with a particular kind of experience. Great. So um, I'm going to introduce <laughs> myself to Jane. Hello. Hi, Jane. I'm Blake. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, I'm just going to talk about my image. Um, maybe I'll steal the camera from Chantel. Oh, yes. Without knocking anything over. Um, <laughs> everything around. So the image that I've brought in is of a donation bin that's been opened and is chocker full of junk or treasure, either or. Um, and I guess this is kind of a reflection of, I guess, how I um, feel like a compact um, ideas, images, um, observations, readings, and kind of squish them all into something like this and then open it up and then occasionally dive in and pull out a couple of things and then see what the relationship is between them. Um, yeah, Fantastic. if that makes sense, yes, but maybe does. not. Would you like me to okay. hold that? I will, and I'm going to... Um, now I'll unveil my object, which is kind of interactive. I need you, Lulu, to... Um, is it dangerous, Blake? I, I've got... I've kind of... I've, I've had permission to... Okay, it's, it's I have to ask that. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, at the table. with a lighter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my Let's God. take this off. <laughs> trying to scare us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've kind of fashioned these um, bracelets out of candles um, that I'd kind of found... Um, during our last heat wave, when I got home one day, all my candle, the, the candles in the candelabra had just kind of like, oh, yeah, bent over. Bent over. Um, so I thought, okay, let's refashion these into something. Um, so, and I guess also luxury is also about, a lot about, um, I'm just going to light maybe one. <laughs> I'm not for the whole bunch. And then you'll you kind of get, get the idea, maybe. I just don't. I'll do it every second. It's your birthday, Jane. Yeah. It's tomorrow, actually, so oh, there you go. And, uh, you knew. It's also creating a bit of <laughs> ambience, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't luxury need luxury light. light. Luxury ambience. <laughs> yeah, I've got my own luxury lights. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Very nice. Thank you, Blake. Okay. I'm going to introduce myself to Lulu. I'm Jane. I'm currently a PhD researcher at RMIT, and this particular image I've chosen from my practice was um, made at an art residency exploring body as site. And as part of my PhD, I'm quite interested in the relationship between well, the unstable nature of our bodies, especially in the luxury context and fashion context, the relationship between garments and bodies and often the slippages between them. So I started to work with things like wigs and body extensions like fake nails. So I thought for this particular um, task, I would move to the real deal. So I've actually used real human hair. And as soon as I did that, that seemed to... Yeah, you might want to pass that along to Robin. It seemed to turn into an exploration of kind of the luxury of power and politics and being the top of the uh, supply chain. So um, at first, like you often see hair made into um, jewellery with sort of gold and silver, but I thought actually the, the hair is what's providing the luxury for this. So I transformed some stainless steel cable wire from Bunnings and it was quite a creepy process trying to buy the hair because once you went online, there was sort of premium Indian hair, Russian hair, Brazilian hair, and I was starting to think about the politics of these people at the other end of the supply chain and how it might have been purchased. And it's not a new thing. It's been happening since in ancient Egypt and in Roman times. Blonde hair was fashionable, so they got it from the conquered people of the north um, that they had fallen to their knees. So it's like quite a regular thing to be worn as a status. Um, I shall put this on you, Shall. Mm. lucky for you. I'm about to tell you another fun fact about it in that um, I thought that was a bit easy maybe just buying hair. So this one's bought hair. Also, often some of the fake hair is gotten from combings where they go along the streets and actually ask people for the hair from their combs and brushes. So this top hair, you'll be excited to know, Lulu, is actually my own hair. <laughs> which Mixed I've, in with mine. I pulled, yeah, mixed <laughs> in with yours, which I pulled out of my brushes, but then I thought they also pull them from drains sometimes. So I pulled hair out of my shower drain. It's been washed in eucalyptus oil <laughs> and lovingly <laughs> brushed it Luxurious. and pulled it all out and stuck it in rows and sort of made this little tuft of my hair. So it's also, I suppose, about the labour that goes into it because they line it up all to do with the cuticles and things like that. So a status of stranger's hair for you. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I will introduce myself to you, Robin. Lovely to meet you. I'm Tallulah. And... I have brought in an image which has been um, folded up in my jeans for a few days, my jeans pocket for a few days, <laughs> um, which is just uh, an image I kind of took of like a, a, a moment of like some suits having a lunch conversation. It's pretty observational, um, I guess, of just a, an everyday moment happening which kind of speaks to my practice in that it uh, observes the nuances of um, our relationships with garments, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and then the other object I've brought in is... <laughs> Come undone. Come undone. <laughs> um, I'll unbox. <laughs> Um, a th I'm a thief as well. So, uh, this is a piece of jewellery um, made from uh, ready-made found necklaces from Savers that I actually couldn't afford to buy. Um, yeah, I guess, which kind of... I guess, questions the idea of such a standard piece of luxurious jewellery um, being made for no money at all. Yeah, so... I'll Do you want me to stand up? <laughs> <laughs> Don't hit me with your hair. <laughs> I might have to hold this on. I'm just going to put it around your neck. I'm going to... Beautiful. Mm. I already collect your work, so <laughs> I really love this. Mm. 
Thank you. I'm going to introduce myself to Ricarda. Um, and I, I have a curatorial practice. So a lot of what I'm interested in is, is value and what happens when something's charged in an exhibition context. So I've taken this, this rather random, but not really random image offline of fleas in dresses. Now this is a Mexican tradition of dressing fleas. And here you can see this whole idea of like a curatorial, it's like a mini exhibition of little fleas with all these particular garments on them. So for a lot of my life, I've worked at the National Grove Victoria, the National Grove Australia, I've spent a lot of my time dressing and undressing. I've also grappled with what should be represented in a museum in terms of collecting luxury. The sorts of things that people go, whoa, you know, I'm going to go to the, to the National Grove Victoria to look at the Chanel, or I'm going to go. So a lot of what I've been thinking about in terms of luxury is how, as a curator, I can make something into luxury. So I've got two pieces. I'm slightly greedy as well. I was torn between different concepts. As a curator, I'm a great collector. Um, I'm not going to confess I steal, but I do find things at odd places, and I like where I find them. So the first thing I'm going to share is this little box for um, cold, cold tablets and bronchitis tablets. Um, this I found at some sort of flea market. But what was inside of it I really loved, which was this beautiful piece of silk. Mm. It's got the original label on it. It's so beautiful as a piece. So why would I want to do anything to it? So I'm going to put this on Ricarda. I'm making it into a braid. Oh, actually, no, I could do it on your hair and really <laughs> I could compete with this one over here. <laughs> no, I'm just going to make it really simple because I think sometimes the most simple things are luxury. So rather than complicate life, to take a beautiful piece of silk simply with the handwritten label and put that on Ricarda as the bracelet. So the second part of my practice has been working in a museum which is obsessed with containers and boxes and the experience of luxury. So I bought in this box and I will show you. Part of me wants not to show you what's in the box because you might just think, wow. Everyone's been saying, what's in this box? This must be really big and amazing and so on. Well, yeah, I think the box is amazing. Um, I bought something really quite basic from Acne Studios. Third markdown, I thought it would come in like a crappy plastic bag. No, they sent me the grand box. The <laughs> box was better than, was, than what was in it. So for me, part of that luxury experience is the box. So I'm not going to put the box on Ricarda's head, but oh. I, am, I have something <laughs> in the box that I can share. <laughs> now, the other important thing about luxury, going to the packaging. Now, this, this was hard fought for. This is Azadine Alaya tissue paper. Now, you might think, but it's got a crunch, it's got a smell, it's got something. So part of what Ricarda will experience will be to get the crunch, it's the noise effect. And then I go to what the piece of jewellery is. My son had an Hawaiian party and everyone hated these lays. I've got them all over the frickin' house. So, this to me, I love these. I think these are beautiful. So, I've attached it to this really beautiful handmade brass lock off a wardrobe, which ironically was the wardrobe I had my PhD exhibition in. <laughs> And it was filled with borer. And my husband said, you cannot keep that wardrobe, even though it was the piece de resistance in my PhD project. So what did he do for me? He smashed the whole thing up, sent it to the tip, and kept the lock for me. So this, for me, is a very special thing. And of course, the keys, which don't fit. <laughs> because I just happened to have the keys. And I thought, Ricardo can have those as a little bit of an extra noise effect. And then this is ceremonial. <laughs> This is the Would big thing. Would you like thing. me to stand up? Or? You have to stand up. Okay. It's charged with a piece of the wardrobe from my PhD exam. This is as good as it gets. <laughs> so, <laughs> those of you who've done PhDs or undertaken would understand what I'm talking about. I will not throw it out. Now it is this incredible ceremonial piece, which I will lend to people who have doctorates. So, you can aspire <laughs> to getting one of those. <laughs> so, that for me is again looking at this idea of value. 
and when by charging something in terms of the context you put that in. Now my very special box I'm going to put on the floor and you'll think less about it now because I'm just going to throw it on the floor. But I think for us in terms of the sorts of conversations we've been having, you can see various approaches to luxury. So we now want to take what we have shared um, to others. So how, what's another context we could place that in? We've done the fairly obvious one. We've worn it. So here we are in an exhibition of Lisa Walker's work. What happens if we put it into another context? So I would now invite people at this table to think about how they could take the piece they're wearing and perhaps put it in our exhibition. You can see here we've got some plinths, we've got some fabric. What happens when we start to put together these luxury jewellery objects we're wearing? So, does someone want to start with... I've only, uh, we've only just got ours. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I was premature. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you can. You can yeah, take I it started. off, Ricardo. You don't no, have I started to with the keys. Okay. You started with the keys. Okay. Mm -hmm. Has anyone else got a thought in terms of what happens when you take that object off and put it into another context, into the exhibition. I was thinking about the idea of the vitrine, which maybe, Spencer, you could help me, mm -hmm. if the item was to go inside the box. Oh, mm. you're going in there with it. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> so you put, Should I put it? I mean, put the box yeah. over the head. Uh, we yeah. might need a luxury <laughs> spotlight. Oh, spotlight. Okay. I, okay. I, want to I think it. there's a quite heavy, so oh, I just want to be careful. Solid. Is it going to work? Or? Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the idea okay. that. That's so nice. So so we'll get you a <laughs> massage later. Yeah, um, maybe. I'll take a photo <laughs> so for you. Whether or not this is an endurance <laughs> installation or whether or not it's just a moment in time, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Any other ideas? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Maybe it's just a moment. I think it's Jan just Yell. a moment, yeah. yeah. Move yeah. on. Yell. Take out. <laughs> 30 seconds. It's a good moment. Yeah. Are we coming up? Yep. Okay, okay, thank you. And we can return this one back to it. I might need Original. you, Ricardo, to take this one off. Yeah. I feel like I could say it. Up and then mm -hmm. put the vitrine on and then the I think oxygen would make it go out. True. Yeah. yeah. A momentary. Oh, yeah. So what are you thinking, Jane? Well, we've got fire and we've got no oxygen, so we could set our lit display up and it would be a temporary ephemeral exhibition that would go out <laughs> yeah. when the oxygen ran out. Shall we? Set it okay. up with some fabric. What do you want through there? Maybe some something gloomish? that's less flammable. Kind of less leather. It's <laughs> not going to go up. That won't be yeah, the glow mesh is what I was hoping for. So that's great. Right. On the table. Mm, I think so. Do we need I think this will reflect up? maybe nicely. Yeah. Too. Get a bit of. Um, oh, that was to brush my hair <laughs> and style it if required. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> There's a comb if you need it. Maybe we can do them like this. You're welcome to, it's real hair, it can be straightened again, so you can tease it, you can do whatever you like. Sorry, do you want some fabric through there as well, or anything going through? Or we could combine. Uh, simple. You're happy? Simple? You right? I'll just light one. <laughs> yep. Okay, enough. wait for that moment, everybody. Oh, no. <laughs> Can you see the flame? I think you're on the wrong side to capture the moment. Do you moment. want to pass it to the room? Yeah. <laughs> capture that flame. Lulu, can I pass this to you? That's a nice one. Oh, that's a good one. Do you want to read that? Yep. I Would think like I'll just interject with a quote as you're doing that, but continue. You can ask a jeweller to examine a necklace to see whether it is made of genuine gold, but not to see whether it is genuine luxury. You cannot tell from looking at something whether it is a luxury, for it may be for one person and not for another. Because it'll take a while. I feel like air will get in here. Okay. The oxygen. So. I don't think it's air time. No, Chanel moment there. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe I might put this with the luxury light. Oh, yeah. Perhaps we this could one. put this on top. Actually stunning. Might need some assistance. Turn it on this side, maybe. 
So how are we going? Oh, my scrunching up. Yes. <laughs> oh, here we go. It's pyromania. I don't know if it will settle <laughs> in a while. I'm going to hide my eye on that. Okay. <laughs> Smoldered. Yeah. So we can see maybe, yes, let's get another light on this because we really, we're competing with Lisa Walker here, so we really have to, yeah. Yes. I'm getting some sparkles. Yeah, now. <laughs> some colour. Hmm. I don't think it's going to go out. <laughs> Do you want to blow it out? Yeah, don't burn down the design hub. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, nice. It's kind of green this one. And this one is mm. good in the vitrine oh, yeah. as well. <laughs> so as as we're playing, as we're playing with, uh, oh, that's beautiful. Um, as we're playing with um, putting putting our items into a, a different context, I'd also like to invite people here of wanting to to discuss with us further any of the luxury principles that we've just been, scenarios that we've just been sharing with you. Uh, we can continue talking amongst ourselves, but it would be nice to see if any of these moments um, has, has uh, stimulated something from <laughs> someone who wants to continue on that type of dialogue or would like to ask um, one, of the, one of the participants a particular question. Any there's a sea of you out there. <laughs> Any comments? Yes. Yeah. Transiency and like impermanency is key to luxury and where the luxury could be exist without that. I think it's definitely time related, yeah. Um, I think that the exclusivity is time related and has to be within a certain context, otherwise it becomes not valuable. So um, the consistency of seasons and um, of fashion showing and display um, are definitely part of that. And I think also like with the idea of something becoming aged over time, like Rolex is apparently supposed to get more and more, you know, valuable by however old they are, like a lot of things, but especially like the condition of that and how that kind of permeates over time, mm -hmm. or something that is just launched, so like um, steezy sort of like easy culture and like kind of lining up around the block and that time-related sort of idea of being there as it happens or something for hundreds of years to kind of, I think it's one or the other, I feel like. <laughs> yeah. In a funny way, it takes like forever for something to become really quite beautiful and antiquated, or it's immediately from the get-go imbued mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah. Yeah, Wonder. like a kind of, um, there's, I guess it's like a short term or long term luxury in that sense, where the idea of a Rolex being an investment piece that's going to increase in value and has a resale value. Mm. And then, but then with like um, buying something that's more like trend based and it's just going to be like valuable for a certain mm. amount of time and then lose its context essentially, it's like. Yeah. It's, Frivolity, the two kinds of different displays of frivolity, I guess. And the fleetingness as well. Like when I ever see someone that's incredible, like looks really incredible. Like I saw this woman sit down on the tram on my way here. Mm. Who works at an op shop in North Melbourne and I was obsessed with her. She's got pink hair and she's got like a tiny like heart tattoo like below her eye and she had this like big fake gold Louis and she just looked amazing and it was so quick and I had no time to even see her again. And I was like that kind of... Yeah, I guess crystallized almost as, I guess, a luxury or something that was like a higher level or something for me. So I think, <laughs> I mean, if that, yeah, does that kind of help in terms of, well, yeah, yeah. make sense? Yeah, I th yeah, I think it's definitely time related. Yeah. I was thinking about it on the way here in terms of um, like Kim Kardashian's aesthetic of luxury, which I think is very much based in um, how she keeps herself physically as opposed to through, um, yeah. say, a traditional idea of luxurious fashion being very based in maybe like opulent garments. Hers is all about the body and having <coughs> the time and resources to really perfect herself. Mm. And because I saw this girl walking down Burke Street that was very, um, she looks like she's been doing a lot of waist training. And yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> she like was walking <laughs> with, in um, like leggings and a t-shirt and yeah. in a very performative way. <coughs> and yeah. I could, 
she, you know when someone's just walking and you know they're kind of looking at people looking at them? Yeah. She's very much embodying that, and I was like, that's actually, like, more showy than, like, a, a huge, like, Tiffany diamond ring or something. Yeah, like, yeah, that totally. Real training embodiment. Also, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, like, behavior, and that takes time as well. And, like, well, maybe, it does, <laughs> you know, like, the, the mimicry, I think, as, as, you know, theft as luxury, I think, is really interesting as well. And, like... Um, yeah, I guess you know, the learned behavior of that. And I went mm. to, yeah, I went to this, uh, just like this party a couple of weeks ago, just like, um, well, it was like a, I saw Nina Kravis, a DJ, and everyone there I think was probably under 25. And I think 80% of the femme or female like, clientele looked exactly like... Um, mm. Kim. Kim, well, no, no, not so much Kim, more Kendall? like... Um, What's the other one? Kendall, uh, Kendall Kylie. Ky Kylie, Kylie, yeah. <laughs> the, other, the other one, yeah, Kylie. Yeah, everyone had exactly the same sort of... Sorry, I hope this isn't too off topic. I think it's interesting, but I think everyone had exactly mm. the same sort of um, physique and the fake natural sort of contouring, and I think um, that's a, a status and a, a sort of sense of luxury that takes time, and it mm. takes, like, this sort of um, building and... I don't know, and I think it will stay forever. Like you think about like Marilyn Monroe and how everyone aspired to be, you know, of that sort of beauty standard, and that is again like a time-related sort of thing. Mm. But it's also probably going to be out in five years, so it's yeah. also transient. So. Do you think it's also because of obviously someone uh, the the preciousness of materials is less precious? Yes, because mm. you can um, spend, invest the same amount of time and capital into you know, making the luxury body. Yeah. But uh, you don't have to spend that necessarily. You can buy really cheap things. So it's yeah, it's not that, that, that it comes about the process. Yeah. Um, and especially with fashion, you know, the price tag is incredibly frivolous and mm -hmm. it is almost about how everything is designed and, like, set out with that exclusivity from the get-go, right? I mean, that's the idea of the branding. And the classic yeah. example is the Prada Nylon backpack. Yeah. That, um, the mm. triangular metal badge transubstantiates the value and it becomes precious. Yeah. And it was also... Um, it was, yeah, nylon, weren't they? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But it was also at antithesis of, like, crocodile skins. Yeah. And, yeah. and there's sort of precious rare materials, which is the original connotation yeah. of luxury. Mm. Totally. And I think we're seeing the same thing again with streetwear at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Mm. So totally. It's like another 180. Yeah. Yeah. 180 and 180 and 180. 180. <laughs> <laughs> Forevermore. Yeah. So I was yeah. going to ask Chantelle and Ricarda, because you worked on an interesting project with this swatch of luxury. So it might be interesting just to share in terms of that sort of thinking yeah. behind what makes luxury. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it had two titles, didn't it? it had yeah. a, a working title to begin with that was Artifacts of Mass Production and then sort of evolved and grew into becoming the Swatch of Luxury. Yeah. Um, but did, I'll keep, ah, you can go. Yeah. It was a um, <laughs> project that Ricardo and I worked on together with um, Clemens Thornquist and Anna Lidstrom from Sweden and we were interested in the idea of kind of the geographical perspectives on luxury as well and how the Australian experience mm. and the Swedish experience and in their different relationships to kind of the traditions of the French luxury were quite different to maybe what this kind mm. of global point of luxury is. And so we're really interested in kind of what we've inherited geographically, um, this idea of luxury that maybe doesn't have all of the same traditions in yeah. terms of material and... And both um, two kind of different takes and legacies of fast fashion culture, mm. Sweden being, you know, the, the originators potentially, um, or, uh, and also in Australia sort of that remoteness from the classic kind of French fashion capitals and the doyens of luxury. And the replication of... Yeah, so in, and also then the realisation that most of the materials that surround ourselves in our lives and, say, fashion design students use are mass-produced. Mm. So that it became a question of that kind of transformation. Like, what do you have to do to something for it to kind of transform from mm. its origins? Because the reality of our life is filled with these materials and objects that are inherently mass-produced. Mm. And so how... Um, and often, um, and definitely in my experience as like a designer, but also working with, with many different students, there has been a, a line, no, 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 it's luxurious, it's silk. 
Mm. Um, but how now, you know, with materials, it's really kind of changing. And that, I guess that project was about that. Like what, yeah. And also in a dystopian way, like what would you have to do to something to make it a luxury if you didn't have any materials left? And also kind of identifying what you were talking about before, Ricarda, as well, where we have the capacity now to be able to kind of consume these objects of luxury that maybe have like the, the motif or the appearance of luxury, but yet it's kind of this meeting of mass production yeah. and the original motifs where yeah. we can and, pump out these And things. also the arguable fact that a lot of luxury high fashion is mass produced, mm. Mm. which is the contentious... Yeah, you know. luxury's changed. It ha yeah. Well, the luxury high fashion system yeah. has inherently mm. changed. Yeah, and I think that idea of like what you were talking about before with the body as well, like maybe the body is kind of one of the last temples of preciousness in terms mm. of material because... Until we get to full genetic. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, true. And the yeah. fact Sorry. that... It's <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah. But it's true. It's That's basically around the corner. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like um, really going outside of the luxury capital and if you look at... Um, a lot of like South American countries, plastic surgery industry is huge there. And it's mm. like there are more plastic surgeons operating in some cities than general practitioners. And that's like just really, um, I think, something that we're going to see a lot more of in the... Mm. Yeah. We have a question from the floor. Yeah. I'm just going to interrupt for a minute, Kate. I just wondered if the panel could perhaps reflect on how... Lisa Walker might be interpreting or critiquing luxury? Is there anything oh, that definitely. Comes to mind? I think definitely um, in some of the themes that have come about in terms of when a material constitutes jewellery or when types of materiality and associations with materiality and jewellery. So I think um, definitely in the practice in this exhibition, there's definitely been a recontextualization of that and a playfulness of what does constitute that, and perhaps picking up with some of the, the quotes and the concepts that have been read today, where it's beyond the materials that, that, that something can become an artefact or a jewellery item. Mm. But I'll hand it over to someone else mm. to answer that. Any other thoughts on...? I agree with that as well in terms of... Um, I, just looking at some of the pieces in the space, it is actually that sort of positioning on the body where you're taking an object that maybe previously isn't associated with that kind of action and it's in that that it becomes jewellery. So again, it's not about sort of the material of the jewellery, it's almost about the positioning of the object in that space. I get a sense of that from a lot of the pieces here. Any other, any other comments from the... One up the back, yes. Thank you. Um, I was kind of interested if the panel would re reflect on um, the relationship between luxury and class, and, and, and I'm particularly mm. thinking about things like the Burberry brand and how that changed from an exclusive, you know, London-based thing to, <laughs> um, you know, everybody's got a Burberry scarf or something like that, and, you know, how mm. marketing and... I guess the machine of, of um, you know, merchandising and all of that sort of stuff feeds what luxury is. Yep, um, I have a response yeah. to that. Um, I was, yes, thinking about Burberry. I always think it's really interesting how they um, kind of stepped away from the design after youth culture was kind of wearing it so, so much, um, like the British, like, chav culture, which is a... Uh, generally like a lower socioeconomic bracket um, of working class youth um, kind of then devoured, you know, and became like knockoffs became quite, um, you know, popular with, the, with that sort of demographic and that culture. And then so then they stepped away, I guess, from having that, um, that sort of branding. So then they, yeah, and I think that is a, an interesting way of like being able to destabilize that. And I think that it's changing quite a lot. It's, there's always this flux I always feel of um, brands wanting to be really ostentatious with their branding and really like over the top with um, insignias, with like, um, you know, like with Fila, Fila and like Champion and all those brands and like, you know, Calvin Klein and they're, they've all basically 
realize that their ticket item is the $50 cap with the logo all over it. And I think that's really interesting how that kind of go comes in and out, um, that basically they'll listen to the demographic and what they desire, but then um, almost too, too much, too sensitive to that, and then sometimes it can be dismantled, I think. And that's, I'm just trying to think of some other examples, but... Um, I, I think it's yeah. interesting in um, a period we're calling fashion after Carl, and we're referring <laughs> to Carl Lagerfeld here, um, and in terms of what Carl Lagerfeld always talked about, democratisation of fashion in terms of that first collection he did for H&M, which sort of changed the course of luxury in terms of being able to get Lagerfeld in um, a store like H&M. So there is some really blurred lines in... It's, it's what it represents rather than what it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in terms of what Lagerfeld did in that sort of shift, it sort of created this sort of beast of luxury where so many things now feed into that particular, particular category. And that's so when you start to think, so what is true luxury today? That's like old school luxury. That's why I'm quite excited about fashion after Carl because I do think it opens up other opportunities of exploring what this thing called luxury would be. And the reason why I opened up the conversation about the fashion swatch is in terms of being here in Australia mm. and this idea of Australian luxury, which you all might start laughing. Is anyone laughing? No, okay, that's good. Um, in terms of what that might be, um, you know, looking at um, an archaic system that still sort of hangs on to you know, what this beast of luxury is. It's reinvented itself over and over and yeah. over again. You know, so the ready wares are now luxury. The street wares are now luxury. You know, everything's luxury. So it, it, does, it does create another, another yeah. opening, though, for what new luxury would be. And I think that's probably what we're sort of teasing out here as we go through ways that we have perceived this thing called luxury. But I do believe fashion after Carl gives us this opportunity in framing for thinking beyond what has become a very traditional framing of luxury. And that's why someone like Lisa Walker, when we start to look at some of these incredible pieces and really looking at by taking something and putting it into another context. And also, let's not forget the ritual of luxury. And I think that's what we were trying to demonstrate today when we went through part of it going back to that experience mm. of how you put it on, how it's charged, the revealment of these things. Often they're quite simple things that make it a luxury for you. So I think it, it's, it's moving into quite a different territory. But I'd be interested here if anyone else wants to comment on that fashion after Carl. <laughs> I think now we've become such an Im image-obsessed kind of culture as well that people are projecting luxury onto things that in reality actually, like I'm perpetually disappointed by luxury fashion yeah. IRL yeah. and yeah. kind of experiencing it in, the sh in shops and um, purchasing it online and the reality of actually obtaining something after you've kind of seen it represented through image. Um, and I think that there is like a series of luxury filters that kind of people um, layer on top of, um, um, yeah, um, items now to kind of... Um, I think yeah. there's like a trend of like, I feel like most... Like a lot of um, people I know who are working as like stylists or as designers don't really wear a lot of new clothing either. A lot of people wear vintage designer pieces and I think that there's a luxury to finding things that aren't. Because when I go into like a store like Marais or something to just like see how the new designer things are looking, there's something really anticlimactic about seeing the multiple on the rack. But when yeah. you go to a like vintage consignment store, it's like you find something and you know that you might not be able to find it again and it feels like even though it has been one of like a thousand garments like maybe 10 years ago it's currently a one-off and that feels like more precious um yeah i guess that's the myth of of luxury fashion and the comment about burberry it's a myth that it is like a singular item yeah yeah and it's like one of thousands and when you realize that that's when you realize that it's not a luxury yeah. I guess that repetition is also played up by those labels, though, with, like, yeah. the slogan T-shirt by, like, um, like in Balenciaga mm. labelling and having that kind of um, utilitarian think, Yeah, I think now, I mean, well. like, classical, like, French people will argue that Hermes is the one true luxury brand. Like. Yeah. Mm. 
Oh, we have, we have <laughs> someone who's valiantly trying to get a question in. Yes, so in um, the middle there. Robin, you said that um, everything is luxury. And Sorry, I can't hear you. You said that everything is luxury and... Possibilities, yes. So, yes, yeah, yeah. and a lot of people have all, on the panel today have said um, uh, everything is, uh, it, things are beautiful and, and uh, in the transactions between people um, there have been exclamations of that's beautiful, that, that... How is beauty connected with luxury in this context today that we're talking about? Is, it, is luxury inextricably connected with beauty and beautiful and what do you mean when you exclaim that it is beautiful? I know that's all relative, but I just yeah. put that out there as a question because um, the word beauty and beauti words beauty and beautiful are being used plentifully. Mm. I think the, with, for me, when I experience something that's luxurious or if I think that it's, it's elevated to me and elevated, elevation of an object is close to the sublime, which is you know, like a very old idea, but I think it's still very much um, ingrained within visual culture and also especially uh, commodity culture. So I think that... Um, and of course, it's always subjective, and it's always, it always will be subjective. So um, I think that it's something that, um, if someone tells you something is luxurious as well, it's part of that projection again that we were speaking about. And then to them, like a trick of the mind, almost, or like a trick of the eye, um, and that imbuement process that we've been kind of working on today, I think, has elements of that for sure. Um, you know, it's like it's almost like the stage nature of knowing that. Um, a dress was buried for five days or something like that and then was retrieved is almost better than looking at the actual dress at times. So I think sometimes it's that the myth of the narrative that makes things beautiful as well as um, definitely what you know, we are told is beautiful for sure, you know, especially in the industry. So I think a lot of the moments that happened here was more the poesis in terms of what happens when you have that transaction between two people rather than the object itself. So I think that's in terms of those moments when you are working with someone. So that for me was where I, I would use that term in those transactions between two people rather than um, a value on the object itself. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think there were moments there that really captured something quite special that I, that I could feel. So I think that's... But again, I think it's a, it's a very interesting... Um, probing in terms of this idea of beauty affiliated with luxury. Um, but there are moments in luxury, as we've just discovered, that are incredibly ugly and dire and, and so on. So in terms of a, a beast itself, in terms of a genre, there are, there are things about luxury that are really quite horrible. Um, so I think in terms of, you know, when we start to look behind the glamour of a luxury industry, where things come from, who made them, who can, who can access them and so on. And that's why some of the most luxurious things are the most simple things. So in terms of looking at when you can have a luxurious moment, when there's a special time. I mean, that's been one of the mm. things that I think we've been exploring in some of our interactions today. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's interesting the point you bring up because beauty, obviously, like everyone's been saying, is a shifting concept and so luxury kind of tends to follow up with it. So going back to the hair example, I can't remember which king it was, but he was going bald and he didn't want to be seen as weak, so he started wearing false hair pieces and so naturally everyone starts to make dye their hair to then look like the wigs that he is wearing and then so you get this kind of flow-on effect where beauty starts to follow things from, you know, as consequences from all sorts of things to do with power and status. So, yeah, I think there's definitely uh, a link, but the idea of beauty changes. And it will be really interesting in that era of resource shortages to see where that goes, I think. So, I think we're going to come back to where we started as our time has run out. Is jewellery a luxury? So, we'll leave you to, to reflect upon some of the moments we've shared with you today. And I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking all our participants.